Good morning, this is Chair Peter Fisher. Pursuant to House Rule 10.01, I call this remote meeting of the Behavioral Health Policy Division to order. The clerk will take the roll for attendance. Fisher. Fisher, present. Frederick. Present. Frankie. Entering the room right now. Backer. Uh, might be him too. Um, Baker. Baker present. Becker Finn, excused. Uh, Hanson. Hanson present. Katiza with tune, excused. Lippert. Lippert present. Moeller. Present. Pearson. Pearson. Thompson. Thompson present. Let's see, uh, Backer. <laughs> well, regardless, we have a chair, Mr. Or we have a quorum, Mr. <laughs> chair. We also have a chair. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Kroos. Uh, quorum is present. We will move on to our next agenda item. That will be the approval of the minutes for March 9th, 2022. Uh, are there any questions or corrections to the minutes? If not, the chair would entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the March 9th, 2022 meeting. So move, Mr. Chair, I'll move the minutes. Sounds great. Thank you, Representative Frankie. Representative Frankie moves approval of the minutes for March 9th, 2022. Please unmute for a voice vote. All in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Members, we have three bills on the agenda today, and then we will also be wrapping up the uh, adult mental health initiative presentation that we started last week. We'll be hearing uh, testimony from the counties and there'll be time for questions and the Department of Human Services will also be here to answer any questions. Uh, so we'll get started. Our first bill this morning is going uh, Chair, to- also Chair Fisher, yep. um, Representative Backer is present. Thank you, Representative Backer. We will we will note that you are present. Thank you, sir. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Chair. That's all right. So we're going to get started this morning. I'd like to welcome Representative Bolden to the committee. Uh, you have House File 4021. So I will I will uh, I will move that House File 4021 be recommended for referral to the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee. And Representative Bolden, I see you have the A1 amendment. Would you like me to move the A1 amendment for you? Yes, please, Mr. Chair. Okay, I will move the A1 amendment to House File 4021. Uh, Representative Bodlin, would you like to explain your amendment, please? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the A1 amendment includes some technical assistance from DHS on licensing clarification. Um, it uh, focuses this bill, uh, makes a specification that the bill focuses on children as the population to be served and enhances clarity on how the service can be funded. Okay, very good. Members, this is the first committee stop. So this amendment puts the bill in the shape the author would like, but are there any questions for Representative Bolden before we adopt it? Not seeing any hands. Uh, this will be a voice vote, please unmute. Uh, this is going to be a vote to adopt the A1 amendment. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment, the A1 amendment for House File 4021 is approved. Uh, representative, uh, to your bill, if you'd like to explain it to the committee, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, committee members. I am grateful to be before you to present House File 4021, which would establish a children's crisis stabilization service. Uh, families, providers, counties, and advocates are in agreement that a children's crisis stabilization is greatly needed, now more than ever, as we know too many children in mental health crisis are boarding in emergency departments or are charged and, and are getting access through juvenile justice and too often are not receiving the crisis stabilization care that can meet the child's immediate needs. This language was designed to support uh, expedient implementation for the purpose of establishing and growing this most needed level of care. I have two expert testifiers to share more about the importance of this service and the design of this bill. Uh, Sue Abderholden from NAMI, Minnesota and Tim Hunter representing the 10 Southeastern Minnesota counties that collaborated to create a new crisis stabilization service 
uh, called the Southeastern Regional Crisis Center. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, with your permission, I would turn it over to the testifiers. Thank you, Representative Holden. We will take the first testifier, uh, Ms. Sue Abderholden, if you'd like to introduce yourself, who you're with, and begin your testimony, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota. I want you to imagine your child sobbing, so sad that they are telling you that they don't want to live. Your 13-year-old is suicidal. As a parent, your heart aches for them and you feel helpless to fix it. You bring them to the ER hoping that they can help, but while your 13-year-old is clearly distressed, they don't have an actual plan to take their life and the hospital beds are full, so they tell you to take them home. Your mind bounces from wanting them to come home to wanting them to be admitted, but mostly you are scared because you don't know how to help your child and yet you know they need help. The depression and suicidal thoughts are only one example. We've seen children being aggressive, cutting themselves, hurting others, having full-blown panic attacks, refusing to leave their room or go to school. And as a parent, you know this isn't typical behavior. You know they are symptoms of a mental illness or poor mental health, and there is simply nowhere to go. There are long waiting lists for outpatient treatment, and so you watch your child's symptoms worsen. This is all too often a reality for many parents. The pandemic has taken a toll on our children's mental health. We've seen an increase in depression and anxiety. We've seen overwhelming grief from children who lost a parent or caretaker to COVID. We've seen children struggle with being successful at school, not just academics, but socialization. But if the hospital won't or can't admit your child, what do you do? Some parents have refused to take their child home and now are threatened with losing custody while their child is in the child protection system. Some children have waited in the emergency room for days or weeks, waiting for a bed or waiting for the crisis to resolve itself. There's nothing that you, the legislature, can do to magically fix this, but there are some steps that you can take that would help. In the adult system, we have crisis homes, places where adults can go who don't need hospital level of care, but are in or heading towards a crisis. We don't have them for children, and we need them. In 2015, the legislature required DHS to conduct a study on how to develop and fund children's crisis residential services. Two years later, that report was completed after research, interviews with families, youth, and providers. NAMI Minnesota and Aspire worked together on the report. Recommendations including bypassing the path to residential treatment to ensure timely access, providing short-term and longer-term crisis stabilization. Families stated that they wanted more of, of a facility type versus a small group home to ensure that more qualified staff were available to help their child. The bill before you takes that first step to helping us quickly develop crisis residential stabilization services for children. I urge your support for this bill. Our children can't wait. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Abderholden. Our next testifier is Mr. T uh, Timothy Hunter. If you'd like to introduce yourself, who you're with, and begin your testimony, please. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Committee. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am Tim Hunter. I'm the Regional Program Coordinator for the CREST Adult Mental Health Initiative here in Southeast Minnesota, and I was the project lead for our Southeast Regional Crisis Center, which you can see behind me. Uh, and so I, I thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House File 4021, and, and thank you to Representative Bolden for authoring uh, this important legislation. Let me see this bill aims to kind of create a pathway for children experiencing mental health crises to access much needed support and safety. You know, as we continue to feel the impacts of these, these times, now is a, a critical time to obviously invest in our mental health system and specifically children early in their experience of mental health symptoms. So, you know, thanks to the work done in 2018, we were fortunate here in Southeast Minnesota to have received the bonding funds to construct a mental health crisis center. So as a 10 county region and community of providers, hospitals, health plans and advocates, uh, we set out to include a children's residential service component. So uh, to make this a reality, we had a number of certifications that we had to go through to ensure access and care for individuals that any individual that comes to our door. So with our operational partner, Nexus Family Healing, we offer 24 seven access to train mental health professional staff. We provide crisis assessments, individualized crisis stabilizations in a, in a warm trauma informed and person centered environment. Now, for the adult side of the facility, this process was actually pretty easy, kind of understanding the certifications, where this falls uh, as a kind of laid out plan and our licensure and all those things. For youth, it wasn't that simple. 
you know, we had to actually kind of find a path to make this work. And so we ended up having to use a shelter license uh, to make sure that we have residential services available for children and families. Now, this method of service delivery uh, does not offer any ability to bill Medicaid for these services and for children in need. Uh, and, you know, as they stay in our center, you know, we, we use unique and kind of strong partnerships to cover those costs, nor does it offer any clear direction on the services that should be offered, the staff qualifications and those things that currently offer the services. We have trained mental health professional staff and practitioner staff, um, but that's not clearly outlined currently in statute. So we have been providing services since July, end of July of 2021, and can see the great impact that has had on our communities. So we know as a nation, uh, we are seeing an increase in those reporting thoughts of suicide. And more locally, we're seeing a, really a rise in the number of youth and children coming in with high levels of anxiety and high levels of depression. Our model offers a no wrong door policy to any mental health symptoms, impacting somebody's ability to kind of go about their day-to-day -day life. Children and families are coming to our door seeking help to manage very unique circumstances that are greatly that greatly impact their mental health. As a result, over half of the individuals that we serve are self-referrals or referrals from a family member. Uh, next on our kind of a referral list is hospitals uh, coming in third in terms of referring folks from the emergency department that don't need that level of care, but they don't want to send them home. So right now, on average, our children are staying in our facility about seven days. Uh, and we're seeing children and families for, again, many, many reasons, but oftentimes this is the first time they're accessing the mental health system. Uh, and so navigating that is really, really complicated. So not only are we helping really offer the, the coping with the current crisis, bridging services until we can get communities, providers involved, but we're also helping families really navigate a really, really complex system and to ensure really quality follow-up care. And over about 60% of our individuals that we're seeing are currently on a Medicaid program. So just to kind of paint the picture of kind of how this works uh, currently right now is we have an individual just recently that was dropped off at the Southeast Regional Crisis Center. The individual was scared, alone, and described as really fragile. The mental health staff spent hours with the individual upon initial assessment, making sure the services were the right fit. It was determined that the best place for the individual to stay was in our short-term crisis residential stabilization unit. During those 10 days, this individual thrived they worked on repairing family relationships. They engaged with staff and other residents. They shared goals. We worked on finding hope for the future. Uh, and they also worked with the other residents to kind of help them find their hope too. Uh, we arranged a safe discharge and then continued follow-up services after that back in the community. Uh, and so, uh, you know, as we're kind of looking at this by passing House File 4021, we can kind of begin the conversation in Minnesota on being able to offer this safe environment to children in crisis. Again, we ask that we are you know, funding these programs that can support children at any time, 24 seven during a crisis before it becomes an emergency. So again, I express my, my gratitude to the committee, the chair and representative Bolden uh, for hearing this bill today. And I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. I will open it up for questions. Does anyone have any questions at this point in time? Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Bolden. Um, this seems like a really good bill. Um, parts of this that I'm reading really do define the, the, the need of an, an, an explanation of crisis. So am I understanding this right, Representative Bolden, that this bill has no cost or does not require um, any form of um, payment system. It's just a basic straight policy bill allowing for this service to occur. Representative Bolden. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Frankie. Uh, we are awaiting a fiscal note, uh, but this is uh, largely uh, policy, correct? And I would open it to uh, my testifiers if they had anything to add with that. Uh, uh, Ms. Abderholden. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Frankie, um, so it's partially a Medicaid uh, service, right? Um, and in some of the facilities it would be, which is of course a forecasted program, um, it would be state Medicaid dollars only because the residential facility might be what we call an institute for mental disease. And the room and board would be paid as we do now uh, for residential treatment. So we're not necessarily adding beds totally. Um, we might see some more open up in the future, which would be great, but some of the current residential facilities would set aside some beds so that children would go more frequently through them, but at least have somewhere to go. 
And I'm admirable. sure the Department of Human Services would probably add something as well. Is there anyone from the Department of Human Services that would be able to add to this conversation? If you'd like to unmute and identify yourself, and please go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, Christy Brown with the Department of Human Services. Um, we have not done a fiscal analysis on this, but we will take a look and um, try to understand if this would potentially increase spending in the forecast and get back to um, to the um, the budget division when we have a fiscal note complete. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Graham. Uh, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on the policy here, I just want to make sure I'm getting this correct. Uh, I believe it starts at line 2.30. When the level of care is conducted, the county board or any other entity may not determine the screening of the child referral or admission to residential treatment facility is not appropriate solely because services were first provided, the child is less restrictive setting, and the child failed to make progress. Um, I won't keep going, but basically, if I get this correct, we're still what we're saying is that um, regardless of whether they were in a less restrictive and didn't make progress or not, um, that if in crisis, they get the service, correct? Is, is that the gist of it, Representative Bolden? Representative Bolden or Ms. Abderholden? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, that's correct. This really is aimed at getting that care to kids in crisis. Um, so. Yes, and, and would if Ms. Abderholden would like to add anything. Ms. Abderholden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Frankie. Yes, we didn't want them to be delayed in being able to access that care. So a mental health professional or a physician can do that um, immediate uh, recommendation and referral. Thank you, Ms. Abderholden. Representative Frankie. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Bolden and Ms. Abderholden. That's, that's exactly what I was hoping. Hey, thank you, Representative Frankie. Next on the list is Representative Mueller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm really um, happy to support this bill, Representative Bolden. I had a question uh, for Mr. Hunter, and it was just to follow up on what you said about the aftercare. And I'm just curious um, if you could talk a little bit more about the follow-up you do with children when they leave. And I know there's a shortage of providers. And um, if you could just briefly, though, speak to, to what kind of care you provide after, um, that would be helpful. Thank you. Mr. Hunter, go ahead, please. Thank you for the question. Yes, so I would like to be, so we are really strongly tied with our mobile crisis programs as well. And so we do a lot of referrals back to our mobile crisis teams for crisis stabilization. Uh, but if the individuals have an established kind of care plan, we also then reference back and support the individual to get uh, kind of either on, um, you know, schedules or, you know, engage with their case manager. So really, it's really, really individualized. Uh, but oftentimes, we're making referrals back to our crisis stabilization teams offered through our mobile crisis teams, crisis teams as well, uh, to make sure that they have ongoing support through, through that direction. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Uh, Representative Muller, any further That's questions? It. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Representative Muller. I do not see any other questions at this point in time, so I will give Representative Bolden the final word. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you again, committee members, for hearing this bill this morning. Uh, you know, we wish this was not needed, but the reality is that it is. There are kids in crisis, um, you know, across our communities, across the state, and so this really is aimed at getting them the care that they need when they need it, and so thank you again. You're welcome. There being no further discussion, I move that House File 4021, as amended, be recommended for referral to the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee. Mr. Cross will take the roll. Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Frederick. Aye. Frederick, aye. Frankie. Frankie, aye. Frankie, aye. Backer. Backer, aye. Backer, aye. Baker. Baker, I. Baker, I. Hanson. Hanson, I. Hanson, I. Lippert. Lippert, I. Lippert, I. Moeller. Moeller, I. Moeller, I. Pearson. Pearson, I. Pearson, I. Thompson. Thompson, I. Thompson, I. Mr. Chair, we have 10 ayes and zero nays. 
Uh, there being 10 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails. House file 4021 as amended is recommended for referral to the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee. Thank you, Representative Bolden and your testifiers for being here this morning. Next up committee, we have House file 4105 from Representative Thompson. Representative Thompson, would you like to move that House file 4105 be recommended for referral to the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee? Yes, Chair, that is my intent. Okay, very good. Uh, I know that at one point there was a possibility of amendment that, that might be coming to the committee, but did not make it. So as, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what the amendment is? This amendment will go on at the next stop, uh, but if you could, uh, Representative Thompson, tell us a little bit about the amendment and then explain your bill. And then I see that you have a number of test fires. We'll take the test fires and then we'll take questions. Chair, I don't, think, I, don't, I don't think there's going to be an amendment added. I'm not okay. sure. Okay. All right, very good. Well then go ahead and explain your bill, sir. Chair, this bill is a response to, to the overwhelming need for behavioral health services in the most underserved communities in our state. These communities are underserved and yet they deal in many cases with the greatest burdens of stress, trauma, and what we, we call the social determinants of, of health. They suffer from, from our great racial disparities in, in, in health, education, income, and contact with the criminal justice system. You know, these burdens weigh on their health and their behavioral health. And these communities are made up of uh, Minnesotans who are African-American, Native American, African immigrants, Latinos, Asians, and Pacific Islanders. At the same time, we have great providers in our community who are dedicated to responding to the behavioral health needs in, in these communities with assessment, counseling, treatment, diagnosable disorders from anxiety and depression uh, uh, to substance uh, use disorders and severe mental illness. But these providers themselves are also stressed and overburdened. They don't have the resources that they need to effectively respond to all those who need them in their communities. Uh, and this bill actually addresses the, the gap between in, in the need in these underserved communities and the response from our great behavioral health providers by offering grants to those behavioral health providers who have demonstrated that they are have strong relationships within our and cultural ties within our communities, especially the communities that they serve. These cultural pieces are their key because it helps providers gain the trust of those in these communities who may distrust other health providers because they just don't feel comfortable uh, in a cultural setting that they're not familiar with. So this bill is, is a lifeline to those culturally competent behavioral health providers who are doing this work, but don't have adequate resources because those who are not getting the care they need, you know, now there are neighbors and are in, in, in their Minnesota and, and also in Minnesota, we care about our neighbors. I know that. Um, Chair, I know that we care about our neighbors here in this state. So I thought this was an important piece of legislation to, to bring to the body. And so I want to, and, that, and with that, Chair, I, I want to pass it over to uh, my testifier. Okay, thank you, Representative Thompson. Next, we'll be uh, uh, moving on to our testifiers and reminding them that they have about two to three minutes each as we start. Our first testifier that we will start with will be Mr. Miles Wilson. If you'd like to introduce yourself, who you're with, and begin your testimony. Thank you. Um, I hope you can all hear me okay. Uh, good morning. Fine. Thank, my you. Name is, thank you. Good morning. My name is Miles Wilson, and I'm the founder of United Not Divided, a nonprofit organization which focuses on mental health awareness, proper diagnosis, support, and treatment in the African American ADOS community. <clears throat> we partner with mental health professionals, life coaches, and mentors to help African Americans in Minneapolis reach their full potential to lead healthy, meaningful and fulfilling lives. As someone who has access and uses mental health services, such as therapy, and has helped peers, friends, and clients open new doors and gain access to diverse range of mental health services, understanding the importance of having a diverse health field is critical to continue to support the awareness and benefits of mentors, therapists, and life coaches. House file 4105 that has been, been presented will help create opportunity opportunity for communities that are far behind statistically. The statistics provide an insight on different types of diagnosis that the African-American ADOS community battles every day, such as 
post-traumatic stress disorder, also known as PTSD, anxiety, and depression, to name a few without that go without proper treatment. In 2019, suicide was the le second leading cause of death in African Americans for the age range 15 through 24. As a result of barriers that would cause prevention of proper care, such as limited availability to medication and health professionals, affordability, stigmas, language barriers, and lack of insurance or education, House, House File 4105 would then provide resources to assist with, with receiving proper care, diagnosis, understanding, and treatment. It also helps provide opportunity to fill in the space with health professionals for job placement and opportunities, creating a more diverse field, which may counter a few of those barriers that were previously mentioned and spark a new outlook on mental health practices, techniques, and treatments. So I wanna say thank you for allowing me the time to testify this morning. You're welcome and thank you, Mr. Wilson, for being here. Next on the list, I have a Mr. Mark Anderson. If you'd like to in introduce yourself and who you're with and begin your testimony, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mark, my name is Mark Anderson. I'm the executive director of Barbara Schneider Foundation. And uh, for the last uh, 20 years, I've been involved with uh, uh, mental health, behavioral health crisis response training with our police officers, uh, corrections officers in our in our jails and uh, across Minnesota and, and beyond. And uh, uh, what I've seen is that we've, we've moved, unfortunately, a burden of people with, uh, with uh, uh, behavioral health issues uh, from the mental health system into, the, into our criminal justice system all, all too frequently, for, particularly for the communities uh, that are being addressed uh, in, in this bill. I've seen systematic injustice against uh, uh, born by the uh, African American, uh, Native American, and the other communities mentioned in in, in this bill, um, these 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 communities uh, 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 bear an enormous burden of behavioral health crisis, as uh, Representative Thompson has mentioned. Uh, the the issue I would like to focus like you to focus on is the question of trust. When we do behavioral health uh, crisis response training, what we tell the officers is, to, is the, the, the main goal is to achieve trust. This is part of the problem here that's being addressed in this bill is that, is that many people in, uh, in these communities, African-American community, Native American communities, lack the trust of our healthcare system. They lack trust of the behavioral health system. So our, uh, we, don't, we, we don't have the connections we need to have but these, but these culturally, what, what, what we call probably awkwardly culturally competent um, uh, providers who are rooted in and tied to and come out of these communities have that trust relationship. And uh, uh, th th that makes it possible for them to make those connections, but they, they lack the resources to build that infrastructure within those communities. And uh, I think that's what this bill is, is seeks to address is, is that, um, that disparity and, and, and to provide that support for those particular uh, agencies that, that have that trust relationship. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anderson, for your testimony. Next person I have on the list is Ms. Parhiko Khanliv. Uh, and please correct me if I uh, mispronounced your name. I can see you on there. You are muted. I'm assuming you're the coffee cup there. So. You may introduce yourself, <laughs> introduce yourself who you're with and please start, thank you. Hi, my name, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in front of you today. House file, can you hear me? House file, yeah. house file 4105. And also thank you so much Representative Thompson for taking the time to meet with the community. Um, and also, before I go on, I would just want to mention that, yes, there will be amendment. I'm sorry if Representative Thompson did not get out of your office on time. Either Mark can speak that or we can um, send it to your office, Mr. Chair, if that will be, uh, give us the opportunity. Either Mark can speak on it or I don't know how this thing works about the amendment, but there's a little bit, some change in there. But um, right, Ms. Um, Ms. Ms. Kali, thank, uh, it just, uh, you're breaking up a little bit there. Uh, I'm having a little difficulty uh, hearing you. Uh, uh, if, uh, we'll have you continue. I missed hearing your name as you were starting. Uh, so if you could please uh, mention your name again. 
uh, and then we were hearing most of the rest of it, and then and then you can continue with your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I am Farheel Khalif. I'm with Voice of East African Women, where we advocate for homeless and a lot of women and children who are daily going through regarding of the mental health and trauma, especially the, um, the last couple of years. I also wanna mention, I don't know if you heard me before, uh, I wanna thank Representative John Thompson for his um, advocacy and support meeting with the community about these issues about our behavior health and mental health crisis that we face. This is a, um, a one Minnesota, this is Bill, uh, we were hoping that you are, you support House File 4105. I am advocating every day to see the issues that we're dealing with when it comes to last two years, especially uh, the corona uh, pandemic that we lost a lot of loved ones and uh, not only our state, but around the country, uh, especially George Floyd's uh, um, revolution that it did start in our state in Minnesota. So this is a uh, investment in our community, not only one community, but all community in the state of Minnesota. Um, we, uh, what I was saying earlier is Mark can speak about it. I know Chair did say there was amendment. Yes, this is a small amendment. And I don't know if uh, Representative Thompson got it on time before we got to this hearing this morning. But I'm here just to say, I'm in support of this bill. We've been fighting for, we continue to fight for our mental health crisis is more than ever. A crisis is a high skyrocket in the state of Minnesota. This is an investment that you all will be brought to be uh, invested for the state of Minnesota. I will, I will ask for your support for House File 4105. This is urgent, this is needed. This is unity for all Minnesotans to come together for the crisis and our mental health. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Khalif. I appreciate your testimony and thank you for being here this morning. Thank you. Uh, Next on the uh, list for test players, I have uh, Mr. Abraham Demog. If you'd like to go ahead and unmute yourself, introduce or introduce yourself to us and who you're with, then start your testimony, please. Is uh, Mr. Demog out there? Not hearing him at this point, or and I don't know if I see him. Uh, so uh, I see him. He's in there, but maybe he muted. Um, I don't know. Thank you, Ms. Colley, for for pointing that out. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> we will try again, uh, Mr. Demog. Can you try, please, try unmuting yourself for your testimony, please. I am not hearing him. What we'll do is we'll start taking questions and if we're, and if Mr. Demog is able to unmute and uh, hear himself, we will come back to him at that at that point. In the meantime, I do have a, a first hand up from Representative uh, Backer. Representative Backer, if you'd like to go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. If I'm seeing this correctly, um, the fiscal note of this is $50 million. Um, how was that figure? Um, determine that dollar amount that would um, would like some details on that, please. I don't know if the author can do that or one of the testifiers, but would appreciate that, please. Representative Thompson. I will refer uh, to to uh, Jesus Christ, uh, the, uh, Mark. But before I refer to Mark, I'm sorry, my knee just locked in. Um, before I refer to Mark, um, you can't put a price tag on mental health especially mental health and behavioral health in our community. Now more than ever, we need culturally, culturally intelligent mental health providers. When you look at the rise in, 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 in violence in our community. Um, a lot of kids are watching and witnessing their friends be murdered, young kids, uh, carjackings in our community. And we've actually figured out a way to, to add more prosecutors which is needed, more, more police officers, which is needed, by the way, needed. But we also can't just lock this problem away. Uh, we need mental health providers. And you can't put a price tag on, on you know, 50, if I, you know, as a, uh, as a, as a member of our, our union, as a machinist, I was also a part of the negotiating team, the bargaining committee. 
I always knew like it was a second price <laughs> tag. Like it was always room for negotiation on the price tag. But how do you put a price tag on culturally intelligent behavioral health and mental health specialists when you see the need is so, so huge in these underserved communities? And so I would refer to Mark because Mark would have more insight, but thank you, Rep Backer, for asking that question. I just want to refer that to Mark. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I would just say that this is a grant program administered by the, the Minnesota Department of Health. And so uh, these, these providers that are, are would be eligible for funding would submit a grant proposal to uh, the, the Department of Health. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, the, ju the judgment in terms of how much money of this, this money would actually be, be spent, you know, depends on, uh, you know, who applies for the applies for the funding and and what the the determination of the department of health is one of the things i would say is that when we're out in the community uh, meeting with the providers the uh, behavioral health providers one of the things they talk about is a lack of infrastructure in the african-american community behavioral health community in and and uh, for example and the, the need to build that infrastructure um, because there is a because of the history, you know, and 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 uh, I know it's difficult to look back at the history, but uh, historical trauma and and uh, these uh, intergenerational trauma and these other uh, these other uh, behavioral health issues that these communities deal with uh, require a, a significant response. And so, um, you know, I don't have any need to defend a particular number, but that's why it was written as a grant program because then. Uh, the uh, uh, that 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 uh, those providers that are interested in in uh, in in uh, utilizing this funding could submit a submit a grant proposal. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Representative Backer. Yes, um, Chair. Um, my next question does, and I um, well, I really understand what what this bill entails, but um, in in the bill it talks about culturally competent setting um i've not seen those three words put together before so if someone could speak to what that entails um so i can better understand that and um i would appreciate that what um culturally competent setting entails please that's my last question sure thank you representative backer uh representative thompson the chair um 2016 um i witnessed my best friend uh one of my best friends and a co-worker he murdered uh, right in St. Anthony you, you guys know Philando Castile was one of my one of my best friends who I work with um, uh, and then right after Philando uh, I lost my mother like directly after that I lost my mother and then right after that my kid was shot six times at a funeral um, and so I, I had I had these you know, everybody would say, John, go and talk to somebody and you need to talk to somebody. And I also wanted to be a good dad. Uh, and so honestly, I never went to talk to a behavioral health specialist because I didn't see anybody who looked like me in our community. And I didn't want to just show up to any behavioral health specialist. And so people would say, well, you know, you're going to lose your mind. And I'm like, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. But I finally found a behavioral health specialist that I can go and see um, when I say cultural uh, setting, I felt comfortable sitting on this person's couch and talking about some of the things that I was dealing with. And one of the first things I said to her was, I was crazy for not coming to see you. I felt so good to be able to talk. And this is an ongoing thing for me and I'll share that with you. Like I, I still to this day, it's been since 2016 that I've seen this uh, behavioral health specialist. Um, Lo and behold, uh, post George Floyd, uh, she called me one day. I had a, uh, I had a, uh, a, I had something scheduled over there, and she's right in the midway, and I couldn't see her anymore because her facility was burned down. Right in the midway, and so I know what I, I what, 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 what I'm saying cultural, uh, culturally uh, uh, competent setting, like the people actually have to feel comfortable about even going into the building, because we always have this stigma, especially in the African-American community. I can't speak for other communities. We always have the stigma of like somebody out to get me. 
you know, and so I just want to make sure that people are comfortable in that setting would also create, you know, and I'm sorry, to, I'm probably preaching to the choir, uh, but I'm, but this is like a true reality for many African-American men in our community. A lot of us are so macho that we don't want to go and see a behavioral health specialist, but some of us have underlying problems. Case in point, my friend Rajan, I spoke to him over the phone. I said, I'm going to come over tonight. I'm going to come over tonight. And, and, and the very next morning, he hung himself in his garage. You know, so I, I understand the, the, the need. You know, and this is something that I'm very passionate about. Um, I was trying to kind of hard to get all of that out. Um, but it's something I'm very passionate about. So I'm trying to be very careful and try to get everyone to understand why we need this in our community. And so I hope I answered your question the right way. Um, and I can pass over to Mark if you want to elaborate a little bit more. Okay, thank you, Representative Thompson. I'll hold off on passing over Mark because I see that one of our testifiers who had dropped off before is back on. So if I could take a pause on questions for a moment, we'll uh, jump over to uh, Mr. Abraham Demog, you are, I see that you're here. Uh, if you'd like to identify yourself, tell us who you're with and begin your testimony, sir. We'd love to hear from you. All right. My name is Abe Demog and I'm business owner in South Minneapolis and Lake Street. Uh, I'm originally from Africa. Uh, when I hear about this things, it really hurts um, because I do have a family member who has been diagnosed with mental issue. And the thing about it is that I want to make a word to everyone, to all of us, is we all have one in our family. Maybe we don't talk about it. Uh, I've lost uh, a 55 years old uncle because of a mental health issue, has missed being diagnosed. So mental health is not something that we need to take it very serious. Now that I see it in South Minneapolis, especially in the underserved area communities, we've seen it <clears throat> after the George Floyd murder. There's a lot of things that's been coming up, and I think we really need to be careful. We need to get a lot of resource and have that out. The young communities, especially the immigrants communities, are being exposed to extremely high drug, high everything and everything that I see. And it really, really hurt my feeling. And those are things that we need to have, you know, this kind of things that would lead them to other, you know, mental issues because their family are not, they're not raised by it's the same mom and the same dad. And I think the bill, the 4105, if we have more resources, uh, especially for this communities, you know, mainly the African immigrants communities, it will save us. And we would not have any disparities. The resources we have is very, very limited. I think this bill will create more resources, more uh, places for them to go. And I think, I don't know, I, I'm really supporting with this bill. And if you guys have any power to do it, because mental health does not have race or color or age into it. It comes in every colors and every ages. So I'm just here today to testify, you know, for the support of that uh, bill 4105. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Demag. I appreciate that. Uh, Representative Frankie, if you have another question, and I'm also trying to keep an eye on the time for our other bill and then the uh, rest of the hearing that we've got a little bit later on. So Representative Frankie, if you'd like to go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Thompson. Um, I actually, uh, um, I'll, instead of phrasing it as a question, I'll just make a, a comment to Representative Thompson, maybe a little advice. Um, I, I understand that uh, we all want heroes and we wanna be able to talk to people that we trust um, as the one testifier and, and people we can look up to or people that we feel we can open up to especially when it comes to um, mental health issues, addiction, um, um, revealing yourself to others, um, and, and, and those are hard issues. Uh, but nowhere in this bill does it say that um, the definition of culturally competent um, to represent a backer's uh, question means nothing about somebody that looks like I do. Um, or similar, it's, it's, and I'll just read this quick here when I, when I Googled it, um, I'll just read the, what I feel is the, the definition part, um, a range of cognitive, affective, and behavioral skills that lead to an effective and appropriate communication with people of other cultures. 
Um, so if, if Representative Thompson, if we're trying to um, get people of color into this industry or, or provide those gaps and fill them in within these organizations, let's put this in the bill. Um, and I would support you on that um, because because we need, just like we need teachers, more teachers of color, um, more people in areas that, that show success, we need to support those ideas. So I support you on that representative. Um, my question is going to down to the bottom here. It says grants shall be used for outreach, assessment, behavioral programming, and to provide behavioral health education. Um, at a $50 million price tag, I'm wondering, will this provide service to people? Um, will this um, these grants be able to help people to get help or will it just provide um, to organizations to um, do these other things other than um, to allow somebody to get help? That's my question. Representative Thompson. Thank you, Representative Frankie. Let's make it a great bill together. Let's 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 make it a great bill together, and and that's the only way we get some of the things that we need in our community is we have to work together. And so, like, I want to work with you to make this bill work for my community. And so, I want to say thank you for that question, but I, that would be my answer. So let's work together and get this because it's needed. It's really needed. So if, if I'm missing something, you know, like words, we can attack words, but I really want to attack the problem. Um, and so let's work together, uh, Rep. Frankie, and man, I really need support and help in my community when it comes to uh, behavioral health and the funding. Uh, I, I know like when we said it's a $50 million uh, price tag, like I can remember like asking the body, um, as a as a civilian and not a legislator, I can remember asking the body after Philando, "Can we just give the kids a hot lunch and a cold breakfast for free?" And I can remember us saying, "Like, where are we going to find the money?" And this was this was prior to COVID. Then post COVID, now here we are delivering food with the school buses. So I know we can find a way to make the money work in our community. We just need help, and I want to I want to work with with this diverse group of leaders here to get this bill passed. So I, I welcome you and to help me. And thank you for your question. Thank you, Representative Thompson. And, and what I would suggest too, is that I know that, uh, Representative Frankie, is I do know that uh, uh, Mark Anderson has been uh, involved in working on drafting up an amendment that starts addressing, I think, some of the issues that you're raising. And I would encourage, uh, 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 Mr. Anderson to, to connect with Representative Frankie and Representative Thompson to continue working on this language for the next committee stop that it goes into. So I want to say thank you, Representative Frankie, for, for raising the thoughts and offering some suggestions. I think with the three of you folks getting together that we'll be able to have a better bill, at the, uh, an amendment to make the bill better at the next stop. So thank you. Uh, Representative Frederick, if you could be quick, please, and then I'd like to get on to the vote to get on to the next bill. I'll just make a quick comment, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I just really wanna say that uh, we know that in educational settings, that students learn better when there are adults in the classroom that look like them. We know in a medical setting that if someone's not feeling well, they go into a hospital, that if, if the providers that are there look like them, they get better service because they're more comfortable to be able to talk about their uh, what's going on with them. Mental health is no different. Uh, the more that we can have a uh, culturally competent workforce and a setting to provide services for people, that look like the providers, the better off we as a state are gonna be. So I just wanna say thank you to Representative Thompson for, for the work that you're doing on this. Uh, it's a good bill and I'm excited to, to support it. Okay, thank you Representative Frederick. Uh, seeing no other questions, we will move on to voting for the bill. There being no further discussion, Representative Thompson renews his motion that House File 4105 be recommended for referral to the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee. Mr. Kroos will take the roll. Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Frederick. Aye. Frederick, aye. Frankie. Frankie, aye. Frankie, aye. Backer. Backer, aye. Backer, aye. Baker. Baker, aye. Baker, aye. Becker Finn. Becker Finn, aye. Becker Finn, aye. Hansen. Hansen, aye. Hansen, aye. Lippert. 
Lippert I. Lippert I. Moeller. Moeller I. Moeller I. Pearson. Pearson I. Pearson I. Thompson. Thompson I. Thompson I. Mr. Chair, there are 11 ayes and zero nays. There being 11 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails. House file 4105 is recommended for a re-referral to the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee. Thank you, Representative Thompson, for the bill, and thank you to the testifiers who took the time to be here today. Okay, committee, we are back to House file 3414. This is a bill that we had uh, heard started hearing last week. I understand that Representative uh, Frederick has been re working with uh, representatives uh, 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 Baker and Frankie on this, along with the advocates and along with DHS. So we are bringing it back today. I know that there's a lot of work that's been done. I know that more work will still need to be done, but we'd like to make sure that we continue it in the process here. Uh, so what we will do is we'll take uh, uh, House File 3414 back up. So Representative Frederick will move House File 3414 be taken back up before the committee and that it be recommended for a re-referral to the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee. Representative Frankie, I see that you have an amendment. Would you like to move the A2 amendment and explain it to the committee? Um, sure, Mr. Chair, I'll move that amendment. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. That should be Representative Frederick. Um, sorry, but thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Representative Frankie, for uh, straightening me out there. I got you covered, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I appreciate that. Representative Frederick, would you like to move? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair. You know, I think that uh, Representative Frankie would probably do a, a pretty good job represent, uh, you know, <laughs> presenting the amendment. Um, as you said, Mr. Chair, that there has been lots of meetings with DHS. Uh, we met with uh, Representative Frankie and Representative Baker last Friday uh, to make sure that their feedback is also incorporated. The amendment itself uh, is incorporating the, the, the feedback that we got from DHS in some language clarifications. Uh, there's also some, there were some concerns about guest speakers. And so we tried to clarify that uh, because they, they, we didn't want to have a scenario where there'd be a guest speaker and a, a provider would then just walk out of the room and walk away. So there is some language in there saying that there needs to be direct observation and that way these providers can also like uh, debrief and kind of like process through what the guest speaker was talking about with everyone who's receiving services. And so really it's, it's uh, as you said, there's more work to be done, but this is um, a product of a lot of collaboration and a lot of work. Um, and I don't want to take up too much more time because I know that we do have testifiers. Okay, sounds very good. Uh, are there any questions uh, regarding the amendment, the A2 amendment? All right, Mr. Chair and members, Sarah Sunderman from House Research. Um, yes, Ms. Sunderman. To clarify, um, there's the A2 amendment is an amendment to the DE1 amendment, which was posted last week. So ah. I believe we would need to move the DE1 amendment and then the A2 amendment. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sunderman. Thank you for catching that and straightening us out. I appreciate it. So actually we will back up and we, so we will first take up the amendment, the D1 amendment. So Representative Frederick will move the DE1 amendment. Uh, are there any questions on the DE1 amendment? Hearing none, uh, all in favor of the DE1 amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. Okay, the DE1 amendment has been adopted. Uh, Representative Frederick will now move the A2 amendment to the, D, uh, to the uh, amended House File 3414. Uh, all in favor of the A2 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, motion carries the A2 amendment is uh, approved. Uh, next, uh, so the A2 amendment is adopted. So next we'll move on to Mr. Frederick, uh, Representative Frederick, is there anything else you'd like to add? Otherwise we will move on to your testifier. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think that we've had uh, a lot of hearings on this bill already. I think it's just it'd be appropriate to turn over to the testifiers at this time. Sounds very good. Uh, first testifier we have is Ms. Amy Delwu. If you'd like to introduce yourself, who you're with, and begin your testimony, please. 
Hello, Mr. Chair and members, uh, Amy Delwo. I uh, work with New Way as the Vice President of Public Policy, and I'm here today as the March President-elect. Um, Mr. Chair, last week, uh, we did walk through the DE-1 uh, amendment. Uh, so I'm not sure if you want some additional testimony um, on the bill. Uh, I think we were planning to stand for questions at this point, unless um, there, you know, unless there was something specific you wanted us to to review once again. Thank you, Ms. Dell. No, we were just uh, wanting to know if there was anything else to add at this point in time. Appreciate you being here for questions. I know we've had a lot of discussion on this. I just want to make sure that there wasn't any other additional items. And would that be the same for Mr. Zerbes? Is there anything else that? Uh, so that would be for questions only. Also. So at this point, are there, uh, we have several people here uh, able to provide answers to questions if there's any questions. So I'll open it up to the floor for questions. Uh, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Frederick, for your work on this bill and, and for being very uh, open to the discussion and and as far as I'm concerned, doing some really hard work on this. Um, this is quite a large bill and there's a lot of facets to it. And I, I wanna thank March. Um, I think personally, a lot of my questions to this point have been answered. I know that myself and Representative Baker have been in contact with March with Representative Frederick and, and, and we've had a lot of discussions. So I would just put it forward to my colleagues if they had any questions um, to I ask them now, um, but we, I will be in support of this bill. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Representative uh, Frankie. I am not seeing any other hands at this point. And I wanna say, uh, also add uh, my comments too, is I'd like to thank everybody for the hard work that's being done on this bill. This bill is gonna be addressing a lot of issues out there that will help improve the environment for successful outcomes for those dealing with the addiction issues out there. I, I wanna say uh, a big thank you, not only to Representative Frederick, but also to Representative Frankie and Baker who've been working very hard alongside. I know there's still work to be done and I very much appreciate the fact that everybody's working together on this. This is one of those great bipartisan efforts that will have a great bill for us by the end of the day. Representative uh, Baker. And Mr. Chair, just, just uh, I wanna also uh, uh, kind of repeat what Representative Frankie just said too. This is how you work on a good bill. I wanna thank you as a chair to allow us to kind of bounce back and forth on this a little bit. Uh, we did take the time, I know we've talked about that before, but we need more of this uh, around here. So this should be used as an example. And again, Bill is a lot of, lot of things in it. And uh, like Representative Frankie said, uh, we'll continue to work on this, but I just, um, I know that sometimes our deadlines don't allow us to do this. So I just, uh, I'm glad we got this bill up early. We had some time to work on it, but uh, nice job everybody Again, Representative Frankie and Frederick, thank you for all your great work on this. And uh, this is some really good stuff in here. So glad to be helpful in any way that I can. Thanks. Thank you, Representative uh, Baker. It's It's been great to have all this wonderful work going on. I'm looking forward to continue. Uh, there being no further discussion, Representative Frederick renews his motion that House File 3414 as amended be recommended for re-referral to the Human Services Finance Policy Committee. Mr. Cross will take the roll. Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Frederick. Aye. Frederick, aye. Frankie. Frankie, aye. Frankie, aye. Backer. Backer, aye. Backer, aye. Baker. Baker, aye. Baker, aye. Becker, Finn. Becker, Finn, aye. Becker, Finn, aye. Hanson. Aye. Hanson, aye. Lippert. Lippert, aye. Lippert, aye. Moeller. Moeller, aye. Moeller, aye. Pearson. Pearson, aye. Pearson, I. Thompson. Thompson, I. Thompson, I. Mr. Chair, there are 11 ayes and zero nays. There being 11 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails. House file 3414 is recommended for re-referral to the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee. Thank you, Representative Frederick and everybody else who's been working so hard on this bill. Next item on the agenda is our last item, and we're going back to the presentation that was started last week on the Adult Mental Health Initiative Reforms Funding Formula Development that uh, was started last week by the Department of Human Services. Uh, we've got several testifiers from the uh, uh, counties that are here. And so what we'll do is we'll take the testifiers and then we'll go back to, 
to uh, questions after the test fires are done. I do know that we have uh, Ms. Grom and Mr. Burdick from the department here to also be able to answer questions. Uh, so at this point in time, I would like to uh, invite Ms. Angela Youngberg to introduce herself, who she's with, and to please start your testimony, please. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Angela Youngberg, and I'm the Director of Business Operations for Blue Earth County Human Services. I'm testifying today on behalf of Blue Earth County, the South Central Community-Based Initiative, which is our local adult mental health initiative, the, Mac, the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators, known as MAXA, and the Minnesota Inter-County Association, known as MICA. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. The report and subsequent plan to reform the AMHI system presented from the Department of Human Services last week is something that the county and the associations that I am representing simply cannot support. There are three themes woven into my testimony today. To effectively reform, to engage in reform, we must first understand the why and the history. Second, have a vision of where we're going as a system to reform. And third and last, be tenacious at driving at outcomes. For adult mental health initiatives, the most rudimentary outcome is access to services, and it's not a math formula. The report speaks very clearly and very well to the adult mental health initiatives being effective mechanisms for serving individuals with serious and persistent mental illness who are um, under or uninsured across the state of Minnesota. MAXA and MICA have legislative positions on adult mental health initiative reform. We support the continued evolution of building out our state's mental health system. We all feel that we have further to go as people across the state are yet unserved. We've heard about that uh, frequently through the committee this morning. They still lack access to basic services. And we view the AMHIs not as pilots as they're referred to in statute, rather their infrastructure. The plan presented last week is the department's attempt at creating equity, transparency, and a defensible math formula to existing funding. The report and corresponding formula and implementation plan lacks a strategic vision for the mental health system, and it lacks any sort of focus on real outcomes to people. Again, to reform a system, we must know where we're headed. To travel to a new place, we must know what the desired outcome is, and a math formula does not achieve either. MAXA and MICA will not support any, any reductions to the overall adult mental health initiative grants, nor to individual regions or county allocations within the grants. Equity should be achieved through new long-term investments. This formula hurts residents in 32 of Minnesota's counties by reallocating $5.7 million from some and giving to others. It robs from one and pays the other. All 87 counties stand together in support of the premise that infrastructure grants should not take away from one to give to another. History. In 1995 to 2002, when the initial funding was established, the Department of Human Services did have a vision. The report does not share this. I can personally speak to it, having worked in the mental health system during this transition. The vision was to promote deinstitutionalization of individuals from the state hospitals. Limited funding was allocated to regions where those individuals were likely to reside, and the state knew a community-based infrastructure needed to be established. In some areas, the state invested money. In other areas, the state mobilized staff from the state hospitals. It's true that not each region received an equal share. There simply wasn't enough resource to go around at the time. The plan was to continually invest in the areas that did not receive funding in the beginning. This hasn't occurred in the way that it was meant to. The state's investment in adult mental health initiatives didn't continue to address the inequities. In fact, currently counties invest around two times more local dollars than the state in these program areas specifically. Currently mental health services are in the highest demand we've seen in years and on average, providers with wait lists for adult mental health initiative services would need to increase services by over 20% just to meet the current demands. County and AMHI participants in the work group that the, that the um, report referenced shared their voices were very limited. 
the discussion was not on AMHI reform as a visionary endeavor, rather to simply weight variables on an already determined formula. Some statements received from the participants were DHS invited us to the table, but it was not a partnership. The formula still doesn't sufficiently address racial inequity. And although the report, the map in the report says I was present for 100% of the meetings, I was not 100% in support of the outcome. It was an effort to comment on surface details without providing the opportunity to influence the purpose or intention with the actual foundation of the initiatives. Letters have been written from regions to DHS leadership imploring them to consider the negative effects of reform in this way to no real response other than the work of the group has not yet been completed. So this is um, certainly since this report has been released uh, in February, um, this is uh, a past comment. Speaking directly from the region I represent, the formula, if the formula is implemented, we will lose approximately 20 FTE in our local workforce with impacts in psychiatry, nursing, community supports, jail diversion, crisis services, case management, and potentially other areas. This will undoubtedly result in increased hospitalizations, public safety concerns, and devastating effects on individuals. We're not the only region that will be forced to devolve our mental health system. This is the wrong direction. Now, for the regions that stood to gain funding in this formula, it is desperately in need. In some areas of the state, maintaining a base workforce and mental health is near impossible. They have yet to build out their infrastructure and has, have deserved the opportunity for many years. Counties see the current state as an opportunity to continue to advance the vision of a mental health infrastructure from so many years ago, rather than to come alongside a lacking vision of today. So I just thank you for your time and attention to this important topic for counties and more importantly for the individuals that are impacted by these decisions. I urge you to hold counties and DHS to principles of reform, knowing the history, having a vision and focusing on outcomes, even ones that are as basic as access to services. I will remain available for questions following my colleague's testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Youngerberger. Next we have uh, Ms. Lena Mersch if you'd like to introduce yourself and who you're with and start your testimony, please. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Linnea Mersch and I'm the Director of Public Health and Human Services for St. Louis County. I'm also here as a representative of MAXA and MICA and on behalf of our Region 3 AMHI. Thank you for the opportunity to share our perspective. A sentence in the summary of the legislative report recently filed by DHS explains, quote, Initial funding determinations for AMHIs were not uniform, equitable, or transparent, and were based on proximity to state hospitals that closed in the 1990s. We heard from DHS's testimony last week that there wasn't a rhyme or reason to these allocations. On the contrary, a review of how the Moose Lake catchment area closure funds came to be for the 11 counties in northern and northeastern Minnesota most impacted shows a specific intention, and while not uniform in comparison to other regions, it was proportionate to the forecasted impact. 1992 legislation authorizing the closure of the state's Moose Lake Regional Treatment Center required DHS to ensure that community-based alternatives were adequate to meet needs within this area and that no additional local county property tax ex expenditures would be required to support services. While alternative funding was provided to support community-based care options through the counties, the promised state services were not developed. To this day, unlike other regions of the state, this area continues to lack local access to a community behavioral health hospital for short-term acute inpatient psychiatric care. Since the closure of the Moose Lake Regional Treatment Center in 1994, the 11 counties in this catchment area received $2.7 million annually to provide community-based mental health services. Funds are distributed directly to each county and they have been distributed separate from the adult mental health initiative funds. In 2023, the Department of Human Services plans to integrate the Moose Lake Alternative Funds into the statewide AMHI fund and with the proposed formula changes effective 2025-26, our region will lose 25% of the newly combined total base nearly a million, and as Angie stated, 
these funds are used for local workforce, both at the county level and in our core community behavioral um, partners or community mental health centers. This work isn't a math formula to be achieved through equal allocations as access, needs, and state services vary extensively across the street. Equality and equity are not the same. Unfortunately, the simplistic approach proposed here without regard to the why behind the allocations that constitute that base will result in an unnecessary reduction of essential services in 32 of Minnesota's counties. The historical allocation base comprises previous state investments, like what our region has received. Um, and this needs to be taken into consideration with this work. So Minnesota counties are asking you to hold all counties harmless. We'll work with DHS on the needed updates to Minnesota statute 245.4661 to reflect the current roles of AMHIs as the mental health infrastructure throughout our state. We'd welcome the opportunity to continue to work together on the formula and the implementation plan. Please recognize that ever since Minnesota stopped institutionalizing people experiencing mental health challenges and instead providing them with county-based community mental health services, these AMHI funds are the critical state support of the local mental health safety net. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mersh. Next, we have uh, Ms. Jane Hardwick. If you'd like to introduce yourself, we are with and start your testimony, please. Absolutely. So I am Jane Hardwick. I'm the Human Services Director for Dodge, Steel, and Waseca Counties. I uh, currently, um, excuse me, sorry, I lost my electronic version. So we'll go with paper, backup paper here. Uh, so I am the Human Services Director for Dodge, Steel, and Waseca County, and we're known as Min Prairie. And I'm also the fiscal lead for MAXA. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm from Southeastern Minnesota, and our adult mental health initiative region is called CREST. And CREST would stand to gain funding as part of the redistribution of the DHS funding allocation model if it were adopted without any new money. Um, and I can't uh, pretend that I don't sit here and look across the state and with envy at the level of resources that some of our other uh, 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 adult mental health initiatives have. But at the same time, I'm here to share a perspective that the idea of redistributing the funds appropriated at their current level, in other words, taking funding from one region and shifting it to another, based on the updated formula will damage an already fragile mental health system. As counties, we have countless experiences where funding was allocated from a limited or non-forecasted appropriate grant appropriation that's not adequate to meet its intended need across the entire state. And often in those situations, counties will uh, do the best they can with the resources that are available and find that in the next grant cycle, they no longer have access to that same level of funding. Um, and that because DHS often in other situations spreads that same resource more thinly across a broader a geographic area. There are examples in housing programs, child welfare programs, and one that comes to mind for Southeast Minnesota that's more recent for us um, is our mobile mental health crisis grant. We happen to be um, an early uh, grant recipient in that area. Um, and in the subsequent grant, we just got our system up and running, got the infrastructure in place. And in the next grant cycle, we got a 45% reduction um, in the grant resources because DHS spread that same appropriation across a broader array of counties. So that destabilized our uh, mobile crisis system. Um, and we had to pull back on the robustness of our mental health stabilization supports and other training necessary to have an effective system in addition, in addition to shifting some of that cost to local levy. This destabilizes systems. Um, so as we face the potential for a redistribution of the adult mental health initiative grants across the state, we are expectedly concerned. Um, so we do, while we do support redistribution of grants uh, in a couple of situations, for example, when a resource isn't being used as it was intended, or when a resource was intended for seed money or startup costs to build up an infrastructure that would be sustained by other uh, resource, intended resources, it makes sense to redistribute those. Um, but that is not the case with the Adult Mental Health Initiative grant funds. If the current appropriation level was at the level 
necessary to build and support a full continuum of mental health services for people with serious and persistent mental illness and put in place measures of prevention and earlier intervention, I would have no qualms about shifting or redistributing based on a suitable formula. But the idea of taking funds from an area that by virtue of the original distribution formula, um, when they're still not adequately funded to provide a robust mental health system is troubling. The result will be either that the regions, and you've heard it from the other two testifiers today, those regions will need to reduce the supports for people with mental illness or shift those uh, cost to local property tax uh, payers um, or some combination thereof. Neither of these is an appropriate solution, especially when we know our continuum of mental health services is still being built. Um, while what we have in place is well done, it is still wholly inadequate. And the demand for mental health services, as you've heard over and over again, is growing. We have a mental health workforce shortage and our system is very fragile with that increased demand with all of these other factors in place. And the forecast, of course, positions the legislature to make additional investments in better serving people with life altering mental illnesses that affect not only those people and their loved ones, but our communities. Um, and other parts of our public system. You hear from law enforcement, from human services, from healthcare, from corrections, et cetera. There, this, the threads throughout our community are strong and impactful when we don't fully support people with um, very serious mental illnesses. So to be clear, our local adult mental health initiative region would stand to gain under the formula that's been put forward but neither Maxa nor I support the planned redistribution until there are additional resources appropriated and a new formula is phased in over the current allocation so that we're not tearing down one region's fragile mental health system to build up another's. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hardwick. Uh, and thank you to the test fires for being here. Uh, what I'd like to do is open it up for questions. We've got about uh, 12 to 14 minutes before we end. So we've got uh, time for those that would like to ask questions. I know I've got, I do have a few that I have, but I also know that there's probably some others. Uh, and I see Representative Frankie kind of uh, coming forward here. Is that uh, correct, Representative Frankie, that you'd like to start? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank all the testifiers. Um, personally, I was made aware of this um, situation just not too long ago um, when Maxo was at the Capitol uh, and I was I'm still waiting on some information on it but these presentations really help and help me to understand what's going on and um, yeah I, I don't agree with this uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul and, and leaving other people in the lurch especially when some of the counties that I see are being adversely affected are some of the counties that that need the most help um, I guess one of my questions would be, does anybody know if there's anything moving forward to, to fix this situation? Is it strictly a funding thing? Is it a one-time funding thing or is it a, the, will we need to produce a reformulation to just keep this funding at least stable going forward so we do no harm? Uh, who would like to try to answer that first? I can open up to any of the test buyers or DHS of DHS that might have ideas what it will take. I've heard some things in the background, but I'd like to see if any of the folks we have with us today have thoughts or ideas or know what might or what they might be aware of that's happening on the landscape. Uh, and maybe DHS, DHS, maybe some from DHS could tell us what kind of dollar amount increase we would need to make sure that under the current formula, we would have to hold that, that is being proposed would be needed to make sure that everybody was hold, held harmless so that there'd be no counties suffering a loss. Ms. Graham. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Christy Graham with the Department of Human Services. Um, we would need to see the bill language for that and do a fiscal note to determine that, that amount, but we'd be happy to continue the conversation. Um, and I would defer to the counties um, who have indicated they are working on legislation themselves, so they might have more to offer. Okay. Is there anyone from the county that would like to try, counties that would like to try to answer that question? I, I Mr. Ah. Chair, I can, I can attempt to um, provide shed some light on it. I was actually looking for my notes here and what all happens right. is I have too many windows open all at the same time. 
And I also see uh, Mr. Matt Freeman has got his hand up. If you don't mind, I'll go with him first and come back to you if you'd like to add on. Mr. Freeman, sure. if you'd uh, like to introduce yourself, who you're with, and, and start your testimony. Your thank you, Chair Fisher. Um, Matt Freeman, I'm the Executive Director of MAXA, the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators, and also the Human Services um, Policy Analyst for the Association of Minnesota Counties. Um, we are in the process of working with Representative Ryer on specific uh, language for a appropriation. Um, we're trying to analyze specifically the formula that exists in statute and um, how that allocation, if it were uh, fully funded according to that language, what that amount would be, uh, while also gathering information like um, Mrs. Youngerberg referenced um, through survey uh, to address access and waiting lists. So um, that language, I believe, is in the process of being drafted, uh, and we'd appreciate uh, your consideration uh, of that bill once it is it is formalized. We've had discussions uh, with a number of members on on both uh, sides of the legislature about this and, and um, would appreciate uh, further conversation about what that amount is to, um, to ensure we fully fund this important infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Uh, Ms. Youngerberger, uh, Youngerberg, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Freeman said it very well uh, where we're at. Uh, what I would like to add is that the concerns really are um, you know, that it's a funding issue and that um, in order to bring equity, it would take significant um, funding to truly hold counties harmless. There's also in the report an absence, um, but there's a, there's a reference to, but an absence of details around um, tribal adult mental health initiatives. And if there's no new funding going into the pie, basically, so if we have a $33 million pie, and we're adding tribal entities in there, it further redistributes funding away from um, the adult mental health initiatives, similar to the mobile crisis example that Jane Hardwick gave. Um, you add more entities in, everything gets, gets uh, thin. Really, counties are struggling with the base principle behind this, which is that Rob Peter to pay Paul principle, and how that could, if supported, even in this one instance, um, really make its ways through all of human services. We do receive grant funding in other areas too. And so how redistribution is looked at from a departmental stance and if supported, how that might um, really cause significant concerns across other uh, business areas within human services that provide infrastructure such as um, child welfare services and others um, as, as shared by the testimony. Um, Mr. Freeman did uh, uh, share a bit about uh, a survey that was conducted and just on that basic quick survey, uh, and I know in my testimony I did say over 20% of an increase would be needed to address today's waiting lists for services within the mental health initiatives. So that, that gives a bit of a picture, um, but not full. Okay, thank you, Ms. Youngerberger. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, uh, Representative Frankie, do you have other questions? No, I guess my basic question premise was, do we have somebody working on this? Do we need to get on this um, and, and move, start it moving forward? So I'm glad to hear that somebody's working on it um, because after I'd asked the questions, I had not received the information. So um, just looking forward to see what we have coming forward and offer my support. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Fr uh, Representative Frankie. Uh, and you know, a couple questions I have is, uh, you know, if I uh, and I did a quick back of the napkin kind of thing on the uh, dollars. Is it seems that if we were to use the current formula and keep everyone whole so that there's no losses, that it may need to, like a twenty million dollar increase. I'm not saying you know, yes, no, whatever. I'm just saying if we were using the current formula. And, and the reason I'm bringing that up is one of the questions I have is, is to the counties and to, if DHS wants to comment on it, is how do you feel about the current ratios in the formula? In other words, say if we had the unlimited pot of money out there that it would take to make sure that people are held harmless, are the formulas that are being used out there, uh, you know, the percentages? Because when I was taking a look at it, it looked like 
uh, they were taking a look at population, social determinants, um, you know, the ADI and rural allocation, uh, taking a look at how much was SUD percent, deep poverty, medical risk, et cetera. How did the counties feel about the weights and everything that were being used in the formulas? Does it seem that the process through there was good? And now I'm, I'm taking, setting the pot of money off to the side. And the reason I'm asking is because if that is a proper form, formula, then what we should be looking at really is taking a look at what that base of dollar amount we should be uh, using out there. And that's the way I'm trying to press it. It's more from the dollars and cents thing. So I, I really uh, appreciate the feedback that uh, folks could provide on the weights that are in the formula right now that were being provided in the final recommendations by the state. And I know that's a big question. So I was wondering who would like to try to tackle that? Mr. Chair, I can attempt. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Yager Berg. If any other county rep wants to uh, chime in, they certainly may. Um, the feedback from the participants that were in the group, um, mm -hmm. you know, while they do support the weighting of some of the factors, um, there's some pretty clear response that we got from a number of participants saying that there's still factors that if, if it's possible to break this down to a scientific math formula, which is where counties are suggesting it's not, because a math formula is not attached to a vision. We would say, we would prefer the formula to say, where are we going to versus what is this math inequity about? Um, just to, to break it down to the specific question about the current factors, the two areas that kept coming up by participants in our um, follow-up conversation were racial inequity was uh, quite absent in the conversation and uh, they really wanted more um, emphasis and time and attention to that very important topic as well as the corrections and public safety influences um, that uh, can intersect in this topic as well. So specific to that, those are two areas that, that were really talked about um, and that uh, that was a very, very much of a challenge and it appears to be absent. Um, but again, where Maxa and Micah and counties are at is that this formula doesn't talk about a vision. It doesn't say what should our system look like it simply backs into a, a, a dollar amount based on a number of factors. So for that reason alone, the formula isn't something um, that we feel is adequate. Okay, thank you, Ms. Younger Berger. Uh, Younger Berg, I apologize. Uh, the uh, question I have is, you, you mentioned that we need a, a vision out. Oh, I'm sorry, I've seen we're coming up on time here, 9.58. Um, uh, I would I would like to I will follow up with uh, with uh, the folks from the county. The uh, one area I'd like folks to think about is you know what that vision should look like going forward. You know it seems like when it's coming back to that's one of the things that's missing in the process of how that all ties in. Um, I want to say uh, thank you to the counties for first of all uh, the flexibility that we didn't get to last week and being here this week, I very much appreciate that. And I appreciate the testimony that's been provided and the thoughts that are that are important here. And, and what I'm hearing loud and clearly, and I think the commi committee is too, is that uh, number one, if we're making changes, it'd be great to have a vision that's guiding it. Number two is that as we're making changes that we make sure that uh, uh, that nobody suffers any losses in the process and that we ramp up to properly address the needs that are out there, I think is the takeaway that I'm pulling from here. Uh, are there any, uh, we have one minute left. Is there anyone else that would like to uh, add a quick comment? Representative Frankie, any last, okay. All right, with that, I will say thank you to, to everyone for being here today. I very much appreciate it. This has been very educational for me I, and I know for the committee. Uh, we will be having our next hearing on Wednesday, March 23rd. Please keep an eye out for details. And I thank everyone for the hard work that's been done on the bills that came before us today and for the conversations that we've had here and the work that will continue going forward. With that, have a great day, everyone. Thank you.